Oh, what is up, CBG? Actually, actually, I want you to stop and I want you to give it up for your, your neighbor next door, man. Whoever's sitting next to you who braved the weather, we're having crazy weather if you're watching online. Flooding and look at you, look at you, look at you, you made it here. You are hardcore. You are awesome. I love that. And there's, it's great to watch church online or on TV. Uh, thank you for doing that. But there's something about just being here. There's something in the room, man. There's something is tangible. There's a spiritual synergy. There's a faith fusion when we come together. So thank you for taking the time and trouble and swimming to church today. And you're awesome. Thank you for being here. I think God is going to honor that decision you made to be here. As we begin, a conversation about relationships. So I want to talk to you about relationships today. Uh, before that, a couple of quick things. Uh, one is, hey, I have been challenging folks at this campus. This is Sawgrass Campus, our largest campus, to pray about helping us with one of our other campuses. We're one church with six locations. All the campuses are great experiences, but one of our, our newest ones is our downtown Fort Lauderdale campus. And I, I'm praying, woo, like one happy person for that campus. It's a, it's a great campus. Meets at five o'clock on Sundays in the heart of downtown. Uh, I, I tend to speak there live, not that that matters at all. Because whether I'm there live or on video, I, I don't make church church. It's Jesus that makes church the church. And he's the personality that matters. But I tend to like to go there live because it's a cool environment. And uh, I just want to, uh, I really believe that God is doing something so big this one campus cannot contain it. And so I'm looking for 300 of the best, 300 of our bravest folks to go help us uh, seed that campus, plant that campus. They're already meeting. Uh, 300, listen, I don't want anyone to go out of guilt. I, I don't do guilt trips. I think guilt is a poor long-term motivator. I want you to pray, though. If you'd pray and ask if God is calling you to go help us build that campus. My wife and I have been part of this church now for, gosh, uh, almost 20 years. And to see what God has done through uh, us and the original pioneers, there's such a profound sense of not pride, but spiritual satisfaction. And so you are part of something great, but it's really cool to help build something great. So just praying for 300. So if you live east, especially once you pray and see if that's part of God's plan, and get, don't, don't do it because you feel guilty. Just do it because you feel called and uh, help us be part of something spectacular because I, I love what's going on downtown. There's a renaissance there, all kinds of people to be reached. And I think what God is doing is just too good for this one campus to contain. So that's coming up. That's coming up. But today we start a new relationship series called This Is Us. This Is Us is the title. We have invite cards. Uh, a lot of our team like that title. My wife loves that title because she likes to show it the same title because it's all about the beauty of relationships and the joy of relationships and the drama of relationships. But there were a few of you that said, you know, David, that, that title, it's, it's, it's cute and stuff. It's not really that church by the glades, like raw, tell it like it is, get up on our stuff kind of title. Now I thought about that. I thought, you know, guess what? I'm going to rebrand this. Now this series has two titles. If you want to invite people with the This Is Us, feel free. But there's a second title we came up with. We thought that might be a little more earthy, edgy, appropriate. We're going to call it, ready? We're going to call it Bays, Besties, and Booty Calls. Bays, Besties, <laughs> and Booty Calls. <laughs> uh, and actually, we do have invite cards available in the lobby that actually say that on one side. Bays, Besties, and Booty Calls. Give them out if you have the courage. Some people, this is the better invite. Some people, this is the better invite. And just for the record, by the way, if this was my three-point sermon, I would say yes. At CBG, we are in favor of bays. We're in favor of besties. But we're not in favor of booty calls, all right? Just saying. So it's a yes, yes, and a no, just to be clear. But again, we like to speak to where you're doing life and the issues you wrestle with. So there is a title. Grab those and pass them out if you have the nerve. Relationships. So where do we begin a relationship conversation? Well, the obvious place to begin a meaningful relationship conversation is fishing. Of course, fishing. Fishing. I, I love to fish. And if you're new to the church, I find a way to work my favorite hobby into most every single topic. And I want to talk to you about fishing because I think that's a great segue to any conversation about relationships with friends and coworkers and, and our kids and our spouses and dating. Let's talk about fishing for a moment. If you're like me, you like to fish. Uh, if you're watching online, I do live in South Florida, one of the most beautiful ecosystems anywhere. And I love this time of year to fish because God's greatest fish, the giant tarpon, swims the waters of the Florida Keys. I love me a tarpon. It's a beautiful aquatic athlete. Man, they're powerful. They go well over 100 pounds. 
I used to fish for them with bait. And by the way, if you're like, oh my gosh, David, are you killing those tarpon? No. I almost always practice catch and release. And uh, that confuses people too, because some people are like, really? You, you spend all this time in trouble and you, you catch the fish and take his picture and just let it go? You don't eat the fish? To which I always respond, you know, after 18 holes, do you eat your golf ball? <laughs> you eat a cheeseburger. So no, I let the fish go. But as I've done this over the years, I really prefer uh, this style of fishing called fly fishing, saltwater fly fishing, because catching a tarpon is hard, but catching a tarpon on fly is way tougher because a fly rod is kind of real flexible and seems kind of flimsy. And, you know, this is a powerful animal. So how in the world do you subdue that animal, even for a moment, just to take his picture with a fly rod? And the practice is the simple answer. I've been practicing now for almost 10 years doing this. And I've gotten, I'm not an expert, but pretty proficient. My casting's pretty proficient. Uh, I'm good at fighting the fish, you know, fairly good at fighting the fish, animating the fly. I've caught some big ones. Look at that one. I, mean, I, I could put my head in his mouth, man, on a fly rod. Uh, the one thing I'm not good at, you know, uh, the fly line, if you can see this, the fly line is thick. That carries the fly through the air as you cast it. So uh, the fish can see that too. So you tie to the end of your fly line a monofilament leader, and that's almost clear in the water. It's very hard for the fish to see. And you change the size lines. There's reasons for that I won't go into. But each transition is secured with a knot. I don't know if you guys can see it, little knot right there. Can you see it, little knot? That tiny little knot, so it has a series of knots. There's a knot, and, and there's a knot. And see, these knots are strategic because, oh my gosh, they got to be small so the tarpon can't see them. Tarpon have great vision, and uh, they got to be strong because nothing is sadder than fighting a tarpon for, gosh, 30 minutes, and all of a sudden the knot fails. And so the one thing I'm not very good at is tying the knot. I'm not very good at the knot. Now, somebody's going, what does this have to do with relationships? Okay, we're going to talk about all those valued interpersonal relationships over the next few weeks. I hope you'll be here. It's going to be so good. And we're bringing in some ringers. Scott Williams is here next week. I mean, Scott Williams, <laughs> phenomenal communicator. And then uh, one week we have Mac and Julie Richard. There's nobody better on relationships than these two. They're relationship gurus. They're hysterical. Their principles are powerful. I should charge you money for that week. I mean, it's like a one-day like, relationship seminar. Don't miss Mac and Julie. Uh, but listen... Today, you know, I, I want to touch on all the different relationships you value, dating, friendship, parenting, but marriage. Sometimes we describe marriage as tying the knot. You've heard that before, right? Tying the knot. You meet a couple, they're engaged. Hey, when are you going to tie the knot? Hey, Pastor David, heard you did their wedding ceremony. You helped them tie the knot. You've heard that, right? Okay, so if marriage, and I want to use marriage as the example today, because marriage, in my opinion, is the most powerful and intimate of all earthly relationships. Yeah, amen. I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. I, I think even more than, I love being a dad. It's a bigger deal than being a dad. I would die for my kids. But the number one human relationship is not your kids, parents. It, it is your marriage. You know why? Here's one reason why. Simply. Uh, if you do the parenting thing right, someday the kids, they leave. If you do it right, someday you raise them and you release them. Someday they leave. If he's still 48 living in your basement, something probably went wrong. <laughs> but while the kids, they leave, the spouse, she doesn't leave. The spouse, he doesn't leave. This marriage thing, this, this, this knot, we want it tied tightly, right? This marriage thing is for life. Because it's the number one human relationship in the scripture. The Apostle Paul says the best illustration of how much God loves the church, or as Jesus loves his bride, the church, is marriage. So tying the knot. So here's my big idea. I got one point. Here, here it comes. The one point. Don't miss the one point in the one point sermon. When it comes to tying the knot, keeping the knot is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. Did you miss that? Oh, you're confused. I should probably show you the verse. There's a great passage in the Bible that talks about love and relationships. I would argue it's the paramount passage in all of literature on love. It's a definition written by the Apostle Paul. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. To make sure on this soggy day you're in good voice and you're wide awake, let's say that text together loudly, all campuses. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Come on louder. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All right. Let me explain my principle today. It's Marriage, tying the knot, when it comes to tying the knot, 
Keeping the knots is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. Let me show you this great passage. So starting about verse 4, you'll notice the word not shows up a lot. Not K-N-O-T, but N-O-T shows up time and time and time again. So as God's defining what relational love looks like, they can be applied to friendship, to parenting, in a workplace setting, uh, and surely to marriage. Look what it says. Love is patient. Get ready. Love is kind and is Come on, loudly, is not jealous. Here we go. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Verse 5 does not act unbecomingly. That means doesn't act ugly. It continues. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and then it finally says, endures all things. In verse 8, get ready loudly, last one. Love does not. does not fail. Good job over there. Does not <laughs> fail. So that's why I say when it comes to something like marriage, tying the knot. When thinking about tying the knot, keeping the knots, that's the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. Knots, K-N-O-T versus N-O-T. Let me put it on the screen for you. Ready? Bam. <laughs> when it comes to tying the knot, keeping the knots, read, is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. So these knots, these knots, you see, these knots, these negative things that we tend to gravitate to, they're kind of intuitive things and natural things. If we don't negate these negatives, all our relationships will have a degree of dysfunction, especially marriage. So again, there's like 11 of them, and you got things to do today. So uh, before you swim back to your cars, let me just cover maybe two or three of, I think, the most pivotal knots, the NOTs, and if we can understand how these are so strategic and intentional and all our valued interpersonal relationships, we'll be so far ahead of the game. So let me pick out the one that shows up. I'll tweak the translation. I love where it says, love is not rude. Love is not rude. In fact, back up to verse 4, as it defines love, it says, you know, second thing, love is patient. Love is kind. Your pastor is a raving fan of kind. I think kindness does not get enough press. I think kindness is undervalued. We live in South Florida. I love me some South Florida. I love doing life down here. South Florida is an amazing place to live. I love the culture. I love the diversity. I love the ecosystem. I love the weather, typically. Um, I love life down here, and we're known for many things. But one thing we're not known for we're not known for our manners down here, right? South Florida is not known to, oh, the people in South Florida are so kind and polite, right? People wave to you as you drive down the street, but sometimes they only use one finger. It's, it's just not known for that. We, we do rude, we do rude, but the Bible says love is not, N-O-T and not, is not rude. And so when it comes to our manners or the way we treat each other or our kindness or lack thereof, we gotta be countercultural. I can't just reflect the negativity of my culture. I must be a kingdom citizen. And the Bible says many times we're called to be kind. So if you're a Christian in Jesus' name, don't be mean. Be nice. Be nice. And by the way, some of you guys actually do this. You do the manners thing out there because you're in customer service jobs. you got to be nice to those customers or those clients. So you are polite and you are courteous and you are attentive and you do listen. But then you come home. Give it to the people you love and you're tired and frustrated and kind of unload on them. Good night. Bring your manners home. The Bible says love is kind. And then somebody out there, maybe you're in a leadership position, go, David, I, I, can't do, I can't do kind. I mean, people would chew me up, spit me. I can't do kind. Look, I agree with the great theologian Rihanna. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. Uh, the staff will tell you here the DNA at Church by the Glades is this. We work hard. My team, our team is not very large relative to the size of our congregation. We are, we are understaffed, so we all hustle, we run, we grind, we work hard. But it's not because the culture is oppressive or heavy-handed. It's because we're passionate. In fact, our culture, one value here is kind. We, we do kind. We believe in the power of kindness. That kindness is actually a superpower. And so I try to model that as, as the leader here. 
So I found as a leader, when you're encouraging, when you are supportive, when you praise people, when you pass on credit, that creates a very healthy environment. And then in those few moments when you do have to correct someone, guess what? Because you're not naturally critical or negative, all of a sudden they pay attention. If I stop to correct them, that's not the norm. And I don't yell and and beat people up, but those moments count. So I just find kindness is a superpower. So in Jesus' name, don't be a jerk. Love is not rude. Be kind, right? Love is not rude, not rude. All right, let me take you a second one. This one's a big one. It says, I think it's verse five, love is not self-seeking. Let's read together. Love is not self-seeking. It's not self-seeking in marriage when it comes to you know, tying the knot, keeping the knots is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. And love is not self-seeking. What's, what's that mean? What well, means this? We think about ourselves a lot. Can I be that honest? I mean, I think about myself a lot. Anyone else, you think about yourself kind of a lot? So you think about yourself right now, you're so worried about your self-image, you won't raise your hand. You think, think about yourself, yeah, all the time. Anytime you come into a new environment, what do you think about yourself? If you're here for the first time this weekend at this campus, you know, when you pull on the parking lot, you're like, hey, where do I park my car? You know, how far do I have to walk? Okay, where do I want to park my butt or my kid, right? And, and the music, how do I like the music? Did it fit my taste, my preference, right? The message, this guy up here, is this connecting with me? We all do that. It's natural. We all think about ourselves. I think about myself probably way too much. I bring me into every environment, into every conversation, and surely I bring me into every relationship. I'm always thinking about me. Me, 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 me. I'm always on my mind. (laughs) But the Bible says authentic love, and this can be applied to friendship, to a team, workplace, Authentic love is not self-seeking. Let's talk about tying the knot, tying the knot, because that that is the most intimate and powerful of all human earthly relationships. And I I have an expert on this. I have someone, she's been married to probably a very difficult person for the last 20 years. My wife, speaking of knots, she does not like to do the stage thing. She's actually a good speaker, has a lot of charisma. She's gorgeous, but she does not like to get in front of people and speak. But I asked her this one week, would she come out and maybe say a few words about this idea of self-seeking? Would you please welcome to the stage the one and only, intelligent, lovely, Lisa Hughes coming to the stage. Oh, thank you. Hey there. So oh, nice, you guys. Hey, thank you so much. Honey, thank you for doing this. I know this is not your, not, not your favorite thing to do, um, <laughs> but she acquiesced this, this one time to talk about this. We want to talk about marriage. Marriage is one of those examples that we can be self-seeking, and one way you understand self-seeking is expectations. So when you come into a serious relationship, you always bring expectations, and marriage is a serious relationship. And so we're married 20 years. 20 years. Last month. <laughs> Woo! Not sure how I got that lucky. I'm convinced it was a mercy date on her part that got way out of hand. And and here we are two decades later. And but we were getting married. We're trying to think back because every every couple before marriage, you bring into the marriage expectations. You have your box of expectations. And so we're talking about we both had this, what we expected marriage to look like, we expected the other person to provide for us. And so what what was in your box, honey? What was in your box of expectations 20 years ago? I'm pretty low maintenance. So low maintenance. Yes. I didn't have a lot in my box, just a few things. I thought about, you know, once you proposed to me, it took David a really long time to propose to me, but once he did, (laughs) I pictured, you know, an elegant, but simple wedding, just something simple, simple. And then I started to picture, you know, that someday we would have, you know, that, you know, just easy, normal family. Nothing. (laughs) And then hopefully, you know, we could get a starter home, a something, starter home, something right. unassuming, humble. not much maintenance, Modest. humble. Yeah, yeah. I was in trouble from the start, so. I didn't want much. <laughs> but she came in with these expectations, and, you know, all women do, so they had these certain things she thought that I would provide for her. So. What's in your box? Oh. Well, number one, I want to say your box looks way better than my box. My box is kind of ghetto compared to hers. Men are pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. I think women tend to think about this a little more than guys do. So my, well, you had all these beautiful family things. My, my box simply said, guys, I, I was hoping for, expecting, like, just a pretty sexy wife. 
<laughs> Thank you. How's that working for you? And my next picture would be, I was hoping for a pretty sexy wife. <laughs> I told you, they're basic. Pretty sexy wife. Yeah, we, we kind of are, we're kind of simple, but I was hoping for, so those the ex expectation. We all have them, you, you come into marriage expecting certain things you know, to be real and the way it's gonna be. But here's the problem. If you don't temper that, that not, not self-seeking, if that's not something you, you deal with before you, you layer these expectations upon a relationship, um, it quickly becomes this. Um, well, these are the things you're supposed to do because you are my wife and these are the things that wives are supposed to do. And these are the things you're supposed to do because you're my husband. And the problem with that, that sounds innocuous, but the problem is, the subtext is, um, you're my spouse, and you owe me these things. Right. And all of a sudden, marriage becomes a contract. And I don't think that God intended marriage to be a contract. I, in fact, I think what God wants marriage to be is, is a covenant. In fact, what, what's the difference, David, a covenant or a contract, contract or covenant? Let me quickly explain. And if you're a lawyer in the room, forgive me as I explain what a contract is. But my layman's understanding of a contract is it's a statement of expectations. You know, I expect certain things, and I'll provide these things, and you expect these things. So these, these ideas, and if we do not meet the expectations, we're in breach of contract. Right. Now, contracts have their place. Uh, business relationships. In fact, I recommend this. If you're a Christian doing business with another Christian, and it's a large sum of money or a big transaction, go ahead and write up a contract. Contracts bring clarity. Make sure you understand what's expected and required. I know a lot of Christians, in my opinion, a little naive. They shake hands. Well, he's, he's my brother in Christ. I can trust him. I'm not saying you can't trust him. But do your due diligence anyways. If they're a Christian person, they have nothing to hide. Right? So, so business, a contract, I think, is a great idea. In fact, let me just say this while I'm touching on business. And, and hear your pastor's heart on this. If you're part of Church by the Glades, please don't, don't use the church to build your business. Mm. I know it's tempting because you believe in what you do, you're an honest business person, but you get involved here and you start volunteering, or you go to a life group or both, and you, you start building these friendships and relationships and they become your network. You're like, well, I, I need to go ahead and give them my sales card and they might become a client. And look, I, I really want to discourage that. I want to discourage that. This, I want us to be very clear and very singular is what we sell at Church by the Glades. Yeah. We sell Jesus. Right. Right. We're all about one thing. We have one product. That's God change lives. So I, I want to ask you to refrain and not use the church to build your business. In fact, use your business to build the church. Yes. Second Corinthians says we're ambassadors for Christ. We're marketplace missionaries. So take the invite cards, or the other one you prefer, and invite people. Use those. Bring, use your business. Be a missionary. Bring people to church. Use your business to build the kingdom, never the other way around. But contracts, for me, fit fit that model, a business relationship. But marriage, I think, is different. Marriage is a covenant. Uh, covenants allow for grace. Contracts do not. Covenants allow for gratitude and appreciation. Example, here, a contract. Um, when's the last time your mortgage company sent you a handwritten note perfumed for paying your mortgage on time? <laughs> I'm sure no one in here has ever missed a mortgage payment, but it's when you miss a mortgage payment that you get a note from your mortgage yeah, company. Yeah, you get a correspondence You then. miss three, you get a phone call. Right, so they'll let you know when you're messing up. That's not the nature of marriage. Marriage is different. So marriage is a covenant, but before I explain that, at least I was thinking, so, so I think marriage is a covenant. You know, business relationships, that fits a contract. We have a lot of single people at Church by the Grace, awesome single people who are navigating the waters of dating. Which one of these two do you think dating is? I don't think David, dating falls under either of those. Dating, David and I were talking about, is what I call CSI. Does anyone like CSI? Wait, wait, wait. D dating's a crime scene investigation? It can be. <laughs> it can be. No, it's um, what we call character scrutiny and investigation. Ah. Dating is your time to check that person out. I mean, keep your heart in neutral, even though you're feeling a lot of things. Keep your heart in neutral. Start looking. Which, which, which is tough. Which is tough. Because you're dating someone hopefully you have attraction for and chemistry for. But, you know, the heart's awesome. The Bible celebrates the heart. But also warns us, the Bible says the heart is fickle. Right. 
And so when you get hard engaged with someone, what it means to the single people, when you start to have strong feelings for someone, you're as dumb as a bag of hammers. Yes. You know, also seek counsel. If everyone that loves you is telling you this person's a train wreck for you, yeah. run. Yeah. Especially you your, your that. friends that love the Lord and have wisdom. Yeah, just, 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 just be careful. But you're checking them out. You're checking out character. Not just, is he handsome? Not just, is she pretty? By the way, that's, that's the reason why God disallows sex outside of marriage. See, some of you guys think, oh, God's anti-sex until marriage because God doesn't like us to have fun. No, no, no. He, he made sex to be fun, but he made sex to be big. And sex is more than just a one-dimensional physical kind of thing. It's emotional. It's spiritual. And if you're sexually involved with someone you're not married with, it's going to just throw off your radar. You're, you're, you're more intimate than God designed you to be, and you're feeling closer than he wants, and you cannot make that judgment. It's just the kind of person with character, with a future, with shared values I want to share my life with. So God, God's always looking out for our good. All right, so, so back to marriage quickly. So I, I okay. say marriage is a covenant. And again, covenants are different than contracts in this, that there, there's more grace, there's room for gratitude. But the main two differences in a covenant in the Bible, and we see covenants all the time, you know, Abraham, Moses, uh, Jesus. We talked about in the New Testament, uh, the Lord's Supper. He said, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. One difference is this. Every time a covenant is ratified in the Bible something dies. There's always a blood sacrifice. With Moses, Abraham, it was a lamb. With Jesus, right after the Lord's Supper, he went to the cross and died to establish the covenant with Father God of grace. And so here's what I've learned about marriage. For a marriage to be maximized, I, I got to crucify some of this. Mm -hmm. I got to put to death, have a funeral, if you will, for my own self-seeking. Because if not, marriage becomes a competition like who's meeting whose needs more. Um, fishing. Fish, fishing helps with everything. So I'm, <laughs> I'm fishing with one of the young, sharp guys on our team about a month ago. And this guy, he's been married like 15 minutes. He's really sharp. They've really been married a couple months. And he asks great questions. He's on the boat. And I fish in a small boat, no cabin, like 16 foot. There's a, there's a captain. There's a guide on board. And he says, hey, you guys have been married longer than me. What advice? What's one thing you would tell me as a newly married guy? And I can't remember what I even said. But after he asked me, he asked, he asked the guide. And this guy's been married to his high school sweetheart for years. I know they've had their ups and downs, their moments. We all have, right? But I know he and his wife enjoy each other, have a couple of sharp kids. And he asked him, what do you think, you know, one thing I need to know about marriage? And, and the guides, he's not a real big talker, kind of a strong, silent type. He's hunting for the tarpon, and he didn't respond. So I thought maybe he didn't hear the question, or maybe he didn't want to answer the question. And maybe it was like a minute. And finally, he gave out a one-word answer. He said, give. Hmm. Give. And he let that hang in the air. He said, give and don't keep score. And he said as a he said as a young husband, he didn't know that. Like he would try to, you know, meet her expectations. I, I've done one thing for her, two things for her, three things. Now it's her turn, right? And he said, they don't work that way. It doesn't work. It's not just them, it's all of us. So give. You have to create an atmosphere of giving in your marriage, an atmosphere. Um, I'm doing a study, a friend of mine sent me her study, it's called Becoming Mrs. Better Half. And in the first section, she talks about that humility is not natural. It does not come right. natural for me to want to think of David's needs or someone else's needs above my own. It's not natural for him no, to think about not. mine. But my goal is to become an expert on him, to know the things that he needs and that he wants. And hopefully he'll do the same for me. And then, oh my gosh. All right. Um, <laughs> and then when they do those things to meet your needs, be grateful. Be yes, grateful. Good. Gratitude is attractive. Wow. Wow, that is so good. All right, all right. I know, speaking of knots, that Lisa does not like being up here. So to honor my wife, would you uh, like not to be up here anymore? Would you like to? Yes. Give Thank it up for Lisa Hughes. Thanks Thank for meeting so my much. needs. So love, love is not rude. Uh, love does not, uh, is not self-seeking, and this is key. When it comes to tying the knot, keeping the knots is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. Now, I, I, I want to talk about all these relationships in the weeks to come. I, I do want to talk more about friendship and more about dating and how you navigate the waters of singleness and parenting, so important. But uh, you know, when it comes to this marriage thing, I promised you last week, if you came back this week, I'd share a secret. And it's the secret of your marriage going the distance. 
And not just, you know, limping to the finish line, like, okay, I'm miserable with her, but I'm going to bury her, whatever. No, it's not that. <laughs> um, but seeing your marriage grow and get better over the course of years, we enjoy each other more, where it's something very healthy. And so here it is. It's where it says in verse 7, love does not fail. Love does not. Your Bible probably says love never fails. So here, here's the secret. I'm going to warn you. It's, it's not romantic. It won't even sound spiritual. Here's the secret. You want your marriage to go the distance until death do us part? Here it is. I ain't going anywhere. If you're watching online, it's about half people clapping, half people going, that's it? Really? It's not very sexy. I know, I know it's not. I'm not going anywhere. In this life, there's two things you can count on. is uh, God's never going to stop loving you, and as long as I'm alive, I will never stop loving you. And I'm not going to go anywhere. And, and so, he, see, a lot of us, a lot of us um, have this little subtext in our mind, like, if, if he doesn't stop that, I'm out of here. If she doesn't figure this out, I'm so done. Crucify that. Have a funeral for that. Now, look, I, don't, I don't mean physical abuse. There's some exceptions. I don't mean ongoing infidelity. No, th those are different. But I mean just dealing with the crap. Because marriage is hard. Oh, my gosh, it's hard. What great thing in life is not hard? And if you don't think marriage is hard, you've been married about an hour and a half. Hang on. You will find out. And Lisa and I, man, our dating was very smooth. In fact, I say that to single people. You're dating someone, there's all kinds of drama and arguments and breaking up and getting, oh, gosh, that's probably the wrong person. Do each other a favor and run away because it won't get easier when you get married. So Lisa and I didn't argue at all. We dated two years, then we got married. We didn't have any fights the first year of our marriage. Second year of our marriage, then we had kids. We had to figure out how to fight. We had to figure out how to have an argument. And, and so we've had some of those moments over the years. And guys, I'm not sure if it's true of every, every woman, but Lisa's way less secure as a person than I am. I'm pretty secure. Again, my, my box is a simple. I, I don't think things through. And though I've given her no reason over the years to doubt me, we've had some, some arguments, you know, dealing with an issue in our life. I don't mean infidelity or anything, but just... Where, where I was so frustrated that she said, are, are you telling me if, if we don't fix this or I don't change this that, that you're going to leave me? And I'm like, no. I'm telling you we're going to work on this and fix this because I'm not leaving you. And I don't want to spend the next 30 years of my life living like this. So we're going to do the work together because love does not fail. We're going to do the work because I ain't going anywhere. You're stuck with me. In fact, that's the principle. There it is. You are stuck with me in Jesus' name. And so we're going to do the work because of that. Because you're stuck with me doesn't mean be casual with me. Let's do the work. So we have to go to marriage counseling or double down on the whole church thing or, or bring other people into this conversation to help us get healthy. We're going to do the work because I am not going anywhere because my king says love never fails. So there's been about a half dozen times we've had some huge heart-to-heart -heart conversations in my marriage where I'm like, honey, we got to fix this, or this is dysfunctional, and we're going to both do the work. And the reason why is because we're not going to quit on this thing. So it's our only option. I'm not going to languish the rest of my life with dysfunction. I'm going to work through this thing and see it be great. And I can tell you this, our marriage is not perfect, but I love that woman more today than I did 20 years ago. I enjoy her. I'm blessed to be in her presence she is awesome. God wants that for you. Yeah. But you got to get tough. You got to be so tenacious about a healthy marriage. You got to you got to want it. You got to grasp it with white knuckled death grip tenacity. Love does not fail. If you don't have love, what do you have? The Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to a group of Christians who were feuding and fussing and petty and political. He said, if you don't have love, he said, if I, I speak with the tongues of men and angels but don't have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and the ability of wisdom and know all mysteries and my faith is so strong it can move mountains, but you don't have love, I'm nothing. He continues in verse 3 saying, if I sell all my possessions to feed the poor or even deliver my body over to be burned as a martyr but do not have love, I am nothing. Then verse 4, he says, love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. It does not brag and is not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecomingly. It's not easily provoked. 
does not take into account a wrong suffered is not self-seeking does not rejoice with unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things love does not fail I'm not going anywhere you are stuck with me as long as we're both alive so let's work this thing out but David look just just be honest I, I can't do it He's making me crazy. She's so frustrated. Oh my, it, I, I know we don't have the big deal breakers. It's not physical abuse. It's not ongoing, adult, adult, but I, I just don't know if I, I'm strong enough to do this. Okay, I, I get it, I get it. Again, my premise is pretty clear. When it comes to tying the knot, keeping the knots is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. So I told you it comes to fly fishing. Fly fishing, I'm, I'm fairly proficient with the casting. I'm not an expert. I'm pretty effective at fighting the fish. I can animate, animate the fly. I, I can drive the boat. The one thing I'm not good at is tying those little tiny knots. And when the knot fails, it's heartbreaking. You know what I do? I make the guy tie the knots. I mean, I'm paying him. They prefer to tie the knots. They tie the knots better than me. Their knots almost never fail. Here's the second difference between a contract and a covenant. Contracts are sometimes between just two parties. Covenants are always at least three. You, the other person, and God. And God is the one that sanctifies and strengthens the covenant. So let God tie the knot that you cannot tie. Let God give you the righteous resolve, the strength, and the courage to look her in the eye. In fact, if you're a married person right now, stop and look at your spouse. Stop and look at your spouse. If you're a married person right now, look him in the eye. This might be awkward to say, you're stuck with me in Jesus' name. You are stuck with me. I ain't going anywhere, so whatever we got to work on, we're going to work on. When it comes to tying the knot, keeping the knots is the key to keeping the knot tied tightly. Father God, thank you so much for our marriages, for our families, for our friends, for our teammates, for our workplace environments, for people who are easy to love, and even those people who are really tough to love. Because everyone gives us an opportunity to reflect the relational love of a great God. And finally, there's someone today they don't have a relationship with you. Oh my gosh, that, that is the most important relationship on heaven or earth. So it is my prayer at their campus, they'd come to the edge of a stage, find a prayer partner and give their heart to Christ by faith today and enter into a relationship with King Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.